get started with our afternoon session. And with that, I will hand over to our first speaker, Mark Linus. Um, David Mackay when I made a rather ill-advised decision to debunk him. <laughs> uh, if someone could switch the screen over, that would be fantastic while I talk. It's on VGA already. And um, thank you. I was, uh, I'd been invited to give a talk in a village hall in, somewhere in Staffordshire. And... This was to an aspirant carbon neutral community. So the villagers were very concerned about climate change. And I was there to reassure them that pretty much all they had to focus on was putting solar panels on some roofs in the village and everything would more or less be OK. And the organizer of the talk said this guy called David Mackay had spoken just two weeks before and told them that actually putting solar panels up would, it would actually require a lot more work than that to be carbon neutral. <coughs> and um, I remember jabbing my finger in the air to make the point rhetorically and say, that guy is talking bollocks. I don't know who he is, but whatever he's saying is absolute rubbish. And um, the organizer, and, you know, they took this, and I went home feeling pleased with myself. And then the organizer sent me a DVD of, the, um, of David's talk. And I thought, well, since he's gone to the trouble of, of sending me this thing, I'd better watch it. And as I watched it, I was overwhelmed with a feeling of total unfairness, because David was using numbers. And, uh, and there, you know, there shouldn't be, there's no numbers in the energy debate. The energy debate's about rhetorical assertion, about ideological stance, and about contrasting assertions. And it made it much more difficult for me to debunk David. And I dropped that idea fairly quickly and got in contact. This was, uh, and I think David kindly sent me a pre-publication version of, um, of Sustainable Energy Without the Hot Air, and I was a disciple thenceforth. Um, I, I've spent a lot of time doing work on, on climate change, which is why I happen to be giving that talk to start off with. And as the planet heats up and we all argue about all of the different things we have to do, um, one of the things that really occurs to me repeatedly is how just having numbers isn't on its own sufficient, of course, because the same set of numbers can be interpreted differently by different people according to their by and large, ideological or, 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 or political predispositions. And you can see this reflected a lot in the debate about uh, global warming and the, the so-called pause, the hiatus in global warming. Um, they're not, by and large, they're talking about the same set of numbers. Um, this graph is slightly out of date. If I update it um, to February this year, there's a very high peak, um, largely influenced by the El Nino um, phenomenon. But we, we are seeing pretty much, without doubt, the highest uh, temperatures in humanity's existence, at the, at more or less at this point. Um, and in fact, I'm told that uh, if you look just at the Northern Hemisphere during a couple of days in March and compare it to pre-industrial temperatures, we already hit the two degrees uh, temperature target, which of course is the international um, commitment that was agreed at Paris. And in fact, it's meant to be 1.5, which is uh, uh, significantly more difficult to achieve. Um, that's just for a couple of days, so that's the spike, you know, but gradually average is moving up towards the spike, and that's where we have problems. If we want to stay with below an average of two degrees above pre-industrial, then we have to stick within the carbon budget uh, implied volumetrically in the pink cube there. We already know about substantially more fossil fuel reserves, um, largely in coal, but also if you add coal and if you add oil and gas, um, and even more, if you're talking about fracking, then you, you can increase the gas box by a large, uh, substantial fraction of unconventional gas, and there's also unconventional oil. So constantly we're e expanding the boxes on the right, um, and it's a lot more challenging to, to keep uh, to the box on the left with, with that in mind. Um, currently, renewables, as um, David was one of the people, first people to point out to me, um, are still a bit more than a rounding error if you look at global primary energy use. Um, probably, if you're talking wind, solar, and so on, it's, it's about 1% to 2%, um, percent, um, which 
gives you a sense of the magnitude of the challenge because you've got to, the, you've got to eliminate all of the gas and the oil and the coal, which is why when, you was, when Tom was showing um, their global calculator, it gives you a sense of really the magnitude of the challenge and why it's so difficult to get that line to bend downwards. Um, and it's more difficult still if you consider the magnitude of um, the, 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 the prop, the, well, essentially with renewables, you're trying to harvest very diffuse energy over a very large uh, land area, by, generally speaking. Um, and so this, this, is, this is a comparator, comparison for wind. If you have a lot of, if you have this many uh, two, two megawatt um, uh, wind turbines, then that's more or less the output of a conventional um, plant. Uh, what about a one gigawatt plant. Um, you can also do this with solar. I'm very bullish about solar PV. Uh, I don't really see any disadvantages environmentally to solar PV. And we've got a lot of space on, on rooftops around the world and other areas of land. So I don't, this, my criticism here would be restricted really to solar thermal technologies like this one here at Ivampar in Arizona. Um, you need a huge amount of desert to use this technology. And also it had the interesting, I mean, every, every technology has an ecological impact, which interests me as an environmentalist. And uh, one, the one that no one expected from this is that it, birds that fly through the hot part between the mirrors and the towers actually turn into what they called smokers because they, they basically caught fire and they went streaming with smoke off their feathers um, as they plummeted towards the ground. So every single energy technology has an ecological cost. Um, and I gradually came to the conclusion that Nuclear had been unfairly maligned by environmentalists like myself, to say the least. Uh, and the main ecological selling point for nuclear, of course, is the energy density uh, aspect. And I always get energy density and power density mixed up. And David has um, told me about this many times, and I still can't remember which is which. Um, but uh, is it energy density there? No, he's still. Power density, I think. Oh, for God's sake, I got it wrong again. <laughs> um, so the. The, well, what I'm talking. Yes, yes, that, that's. Oh, is it? So it's energy density again. See. Yeah. And, uh, 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 anyway, the, the point being that that golf ball-sized piece of nuclear fuel, whether it's uranium or thorium, or if it was a little bit warmer, it'd be plutonium, um, is enough to run your entire life um, at, at first-world standards if you run it through the kinds of reactors which can make full use of the uh, fissile material. And if you make a sort of land-use uh, comparator. Um, this is a bit of a bollockogram. I'm not sure exactly about the, the um, e exact numbers here, but because uh, I think I actually think if you compare the nuclear box blob here is probably a bit too big. But the, the idea really is that, so all of the people who are constantly advocating that we must get rid of all nuclear and replace all of the world's energy with renewables are of course making the task of confronting climate change that much more difficult. Um, and in fact, when while, while David was uh, CSA at DEC, we looked at some numbers um, when I was beginning to get interested in uh, fast reactor technology uh, where we could potentially um, convert unused uranium-238 um, into, well, into plutonium and then run that through, through, through reactors to generate power, um, such as this molten salt, uh, sorry, molten sodium reactor, um, which, was, uh, uh, which is actually still being on the market from G Hitachi. Uh, and there's enough uh, nuclear fuel lying around in the UK to run the whole country at current output of sort of 70, 80 gigawatts for about 500 years. So you wouldn't have to mine another scrap of uranium. And we could also at the same time use some of the uh, nuclear waste or at least spent fuel that we've got um, sitting around. And this realization has um, begun to permeate the, those uh, members of the, of the climate science community who are, who are interested in policy uh, and interested in the, 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 the mitigation challenge. Um, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with these, these four. Um, Jim Hansen in the, on the sort of center left there is the, perhaps the best known as the sort of uh, godfather of, of climate science mod and, and climate change modeling um, who made the original speech to the US Congress in 1988 at the behest of Al Gore, which really put uh, global warming on the map politically. Um, Kerry Emanuel's a, a hurricanes guy. Uh, Tom, Tom Wigley's another modeler in Australia. And Ken Caldera's an, an oceans guy, really more very um, expert on ocean acidification. And all four of them went to the Paris conference last December. And um, this piece in The Guardian, which I've put up there, uh, they, made, they made a very strong declaration and an appeal to the environmental 
movement, which is very much concentrated at Paris, to, to drop the anti-nuclear um, rhetoric and to go for an all of the above strategy. And that hasn't cut any ice with Greenpeace, which um, this last week uh, put out this latest campaign. Um, and it's interesting. Uh, th th so this is about the five-year anniversary of the Fukushima uh, disaster in Japan, um, linking it with um, Chernobyl. Um, and really, I think, uh, you making, making the kinds of assertions which are t not, not justified scientifically, to say the least. And it's all about imagery, of course. You look, they've got some radioactive waste canisters in the background. Nobody throws radioactive waste into the sea anymore. This is stuff is about <laughs> 40 years out of date. Um, there's, a, there's a tweet that came out, Fukushima linked with Chernobyl, you know, the, the whole idea of... Uh, people have this idea that if a nuclear power plant uh, blows up, as they did at Chernobyl and, and at Fukushima, hu huge areas become uninhabitable forever. Um, that that isn't, um, uh, isn't really the case. It's to do... The reason why you have these very large-scale evacuations is to do with our fear of radiation, which is far beyond what is proportional to the, what we know about the actual scientific risks of radiation. And there's been this linkage of the, um, uh, the tsunami, which was the one, which was the thing that killed people, of course. 20,000 people died from the tsunami. No, not only has nobody died from the radiation from Fukushima, but there hasn't even been any radiological health impacts from the uh, from the disaster at Fukushima to date. Um, you, you could argue that there may be a, a very small number of cancers additionally in, in over decades to come, uh, but they will never be visible statistically because they'll, they'll, they'll be far too few. Um, so Greenpeace Rainbow Warrior throwing flowers into the sea in remembrance of the 20,000 20, people who died at Fukushima isn't, isn't quite right and I think is a, a, a really a, an abuse of, um, a, a, of this tragedy. Uh, I've actually been to Fukushima, so I know a little bit of what I talk. Um, we did a film called Pandora's Promise where we went and filmed. Uh, this is only really about uh, two miles from the, from the reactor site, uh, and we were there in 2013. I'm there holding my um, dosimeter, which, read, um, which gave comparatively normal readings at that location, um, some, somewhat closer in in some of these evacuated towns. The readings were very high. Um, largely due to, to cesium deposition. So I'm not in any way trivializing this or saying that, it was, that, that everyone should have stayed put. Um, but it's a, it's a manageable industrial accident uh, and, is not and is not, I don't think, reason to have to eliminate nuclear power and make solving global warming that much more difficult. I also went to, to Chernobyl. I sort of do nuclear tourism of blown up um, nuclear sites. Um, <laughs> and, and Chernobyl, uh, from an environmental um, perspective is also fascinating because not only have a lot of people returned to live within the exclusion zone um, really uh, uh, against the uh, advice of the authorities um, but it's also this really fabulous wildlife zone you can see all sorts of endangered species there wolves, um, lynx, uh, Pazowski's wild horse, all sorts of things merely not because they gravitate towards areas of higher radiation um, <laughs> But, but because areas of higher radiation are a lot less damaging to animals than the everyday human impacts that we would otherwise inflict on them. Um, now, to go back to some numbers here, um, if you try to illustrate the... I think what is an interesting number at the center of this debate would be deaths per terawatt hour. Um, so Greenpeace would, would be asserting there that the deaths per terawatt hour, at least visually implying that the deaths per terawatt hour for, for nuclear are higher and therefore that it's more risky. Um, I, I don't think that's um, borne out in any of the, the numbers that I've looked at. And it's really interesting how the nuclear thing has a much more visceral sort of intuitive dread factor associated with it um, than, than coal does, for example. Um, even though coal demonstrably causes uh, huge numbers of deaths, uh, not just in terms of uh, air pollution and these sort of very widespread respiratory and heart diseases as a result of that, but through actual direct accidents. And you get bodies being brought up from mines where miners have been trapped underground for uh, uh, a long time due to rock falls or whatever else. Um, does anyone even remember the name of that place in Turkey where 240 people were killed in the coal mine? You do. Yeah? Soma, exactly. How many who, who else remembers it? Who, and who else has heard of Chernobyl as a comparison? <laughs> I mean, it's interesting because about 60 people died from Chernobyl, so there's already four times the death rate at that coal mining accident, which everyone forgot about um, within weeks. Um, and if you try to run this um, backwards, Jim Hansen and a colleague did this, in fact, 
and uh, calculated that there have been 1.8 million deaths avoided through the operation of nuclear power if you contrast that with coal up until 2010. So pretty much the opposite of what the environmental movement has been pushing for during that whole, that whole period. Uh, and the same could be applied to uh, carbon dioxide as well um, with, uh, you know, really um, 80 to, well, 200 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent is, could be displaced in future up to 2050 using the same calculations. Now, the problem is that when ideology triumphs over numbers, you get things like this. This is the top brass in Germany, including the environment minister at the time, launching the latest brown coal power plant. And notice the big green button that they all press to start the combustion in the boilers and get all that CO2 plus everything else going up the chimneys for the first time. So Germany is one of the few countries in Europe which is still uh, building and still opening um, coal-fired plants. And brown coal, of course, is even more carbon intensive than anthracite, black coal. So lignite really is a, a, a Germany's dirty secret. And this, is, this gives you some sense of the scale of the operation. Mostly it's produced by open cast uh, mining on, like this. Um, they even, if, you know, flatten, bulldoze medieval villages to get at the lignite that's underneath to, um, to produce it. And you can get a sense also from this picture of what humanity is doing. We're, we're mobilizing solid, solid carbon and combusting it and then converting it into, into gaseous form. You just see, get the scale of all of that carbon now up in the atmosphere. And my favorite bit is those little wind turbines in the background. <laughs> you didn't spot them the first time, did you? Um, and if we look at uh, the, what, what Germany is really doing is squeezing the, the yellow bit of this graph, which is nuclear power, and replacing it with solar and wind. <laughs> and so if you do that, if you get rid of the one zero carbon source and replace it with another couple of zero carbon sources, what happens to your emissions? At the absolute best case, they stay flat, which is more or less what's been happening in, in Germany for the last uh, few years. Had they kept the nuclear plants open, um, particularly given that there aren't any tsunamis likely to hit Bavaria anytime soon, um, and brought on the renewables, the wind and the solar, to displace the coal and not opened any more lignite plants, then I think they could really be a model for a clean energy transition, which is what the government there um, implies. They should have had a calculator team, I think, in their um, in energy and environment minister, and they would have probably had a different approach, um, assuming numeracy really does win. Um, this is my favorite David Mackay quote, um, because, <laughs> <laughs> and I think there's another tension at, at heart here. You, I mentioned about the dread factor, the sort of intuition, the emotional pull of, um, of, of nuclear and why it's so scary to people and why people feel that there's a risk which is far out of proportion of what we scientifically knew, in numbers terms should know. And you see this contrast highlighted here and to, to a really a fantastically ironic degree. People seek out these radium hot springs all over the world and they consider them to, to, to um, give them health benefits. You know, you go and soak in a radium hot spring, you know it's radioactive. Um, and uh, a friend of mine who visited one of these said to the people, uh, they were sort of slightly hippie type people, you realize this stuff's radioactive? And they're like, yeah, man, but it's natural, you know? <laughs> um, but if you, if you wave your dosimeter around, you might even get exactly the same numbers in the Chernobyl exclusion zone where people have all been told to leave. So I think this natural artificial thing, the naturalistic fallacy is really an important thing here. And you see this in the food debate as well. Um, this, this is a cartoon from New Yorker, which I, <clears throat> I, think, I think kind of nailed it. Of course, the average uh, lifespan wasn't 30 because everyone lived to 30. It was large because there was such a high... Uh, infant mortality rate, which is really something that we've only managed to overcome in industrial societies um, over in the last century and a half. Um, I like to mix things up in terms of the, the politics of this. Um, the climate denialism, climate skepticism tends to be a, a, a right-wing phenomenon politically. Uh, Anti-GMO type feeling tends to be a left-wing phenomenon. Um, I think I think uh, that's largely to do with the fact that right-wingers are very skeptical of government and climate mitigation is presumed to mean lots of government intrusion in the economy, whereas left-wingers are skeptical of corporations and GMOs are thought to map out to the benefit of multinational companies. So I think that's, that's uh, at a sort of very generalistic level how this...
plays out. But what's interesting is that some of the tactics, uh, some of the campaigning tactics are very, very related. So the, if you remember back to ClimateGate, uh, where the, a, a lot of climate scientists were humiliated by their emails being released, uh, hacked in fact, uh, and then combed through and quoted out of context. The same happened to a lot of molecular biologists and people doing uh, GMO type research in the US who were subject to a FOIA freedom of information request. Huge phishing trip, go through tens of thousands of emails. I want all your emails that mention the word Monsanto or Syngenta or anything like that, and then try to come out with something. And they were very lucky. They got uh, probably the best known uh, GMO scientist, Kevin Falter in the University of Florida, had taken a small grant from Monsanto and hadn't talked about it. So they, they then had their um, sacrificial, you know, their witch, witch hunt found a witch, as it were. Um, now, there's some interesting things said by the leadership of the anti-GMO campaign. This is one of my favorites from Vandana Shiva, who is lionized at left-wing liberal um, collegiate audiences um, around the world. Now, you don't have to be a, a sort of PhD in evolutionary biology to realize that sterility is not a huge selective advantage when it comes to, <laughs> comes to reproducing. And yet, she's asserting this technology of, uh, which she's referring to, the Terminator technology, was never actually brought to market. So it's one of these very enduring myths that, th that this was ever that this has become associated with GMOs, but the idea that somehow genes for sterility would jump around and, and spread and, and everything else is, is obviously, it's beyond dumb. But um, she also, this is my favorite tweet I got from her once, uh, comparing me to rape, a rapist for having um, defended uh, GMO, GMO science. And I mentioned about how there's a lot of Im imagery here. This is the archetypal anti-GMO image. Uh, and again, you don't have to be a molecular biologist to realize it's not how you make a GMO. You don't inject a tomato with a, a colored substance via a syringe. But the, you know, if you put GMO into Google Images, you will get up with multitudes of this. There's chimeric fish, strawberries, and all of these kinds of things. Very, very visual, very impactive at a sort of emotional level. And one of the things I would, I would love to do in my work at Cornell is to replace the visual imagery that you get from the anti-GMO side with some pro-GMO visual imagery, like this child in Bangladesh who's uh, seeing an improved livelihood because his dad and his uncle can grow GM eggplant, which doesn't need pesticides. It's, in, it's, it's got the BT gene, which makes it resistant to infestation from their worst insect pest. Um, and there are other traits as well. Um, again, this is work at, I'm doing with Cornell and the Alliance for Science, funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and USAID. Um, the, this is a trait which was actually invented by Monsanto for drought tolerance in maize. Uh, which is now being given, donated, free of charge to sub-Saharan farmers in Africa. Um, there's all sorts of diseases which are becoming more and more rampant in, um, uh, in, in agriculture in developing countries, making it less efficient, uh, and meaning the serious challenges for malnutrition. Cassava suffers from uh, two viruses, brown streak virus and mosaic virus, which in combined can be very serious. Um, these, these are photos that I took, in fact, when I was in Tanzania a, a couple of years ago of families who are really very much on the edge of malnutrition because their cassava crop is failing. And I also knew that just down the road in, um, in a research station in Uganda, there's a GMO resistant version, which is behind lock and key. Um, and cannot be released because the country, under pressure from anti-GM activists, does not have a framework, biosafety framework, to release GM crops. So these will, these will stay in the laboratory, will stay in, the, in a confined field trial behind fences as a result of this. Um, you think that's bad. Um, you could be in Zimbabwe where, um, how about this? The problem of sexual dysfunction is a huge problem in the USA where males become impotent around the age of 24 in the prime of life. Did you know that? <laughs> well, this was in a national Zimbabwe newspaper asserted by um, this, this chap, Mudede, who is um, uh, Robert Mugabe's registrar general, so a very senior official in the government. An anti-GMO theocracy, in fact, has become the central policy of, of um, Zimbabwe. Now, what, you know, there's a big gap here. That, that's sort of selectively edited to make people look stupid. But actually, that would be a s subsection of the better informed um, people in terms of this issue. Most people actually don't care. Uh, they, the polls will show that they will avoid buying GMO if it's labeled uh, very obviously. But by and large, people aren't prepared to put much money towards this. And that, but that girl who says, oh, I don't know what GMOs are, but I know it's some kind of corn bad stuff. That, that sort of sense has really percolated quite widely um, in, in the general public. And this is illustrated by the polling data, which sh shows that there's a bigger gap between the scientific community and the general public on the GMO issue than there is on uh, any other comp 
you know, comparative area of scientific or, or social controversy, um, including uh, climate change, where the gap there is only 30, 37 points. So half, half the public believed in climate change in that. Now, the, of course, there's scientific consensus on both of those issues. Um, similar kind of wording you'll see from the AAAS on, 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 on climate and on GMOs. Um, and you'll see similar kinds of statements from uh, scientific authorities around the world. Now, that doesn't mean much to most people. I think that should, is an issue which should be taken seriously by lay people as a sort of good starting point. I think it's, there's, of course, uh, not just room for debate, but debate and skepticism is essential within the scientific community. I'm not arguing that there should, should be some kind of theocratic approach to this. But I do think, as a baseline for policy making, if there's a very strong, in, indeed overwhelming, scientific consensus on an issue, HIV AIDS would be another good example, um, then it should be taken seriously. And the, the problem is, of course, you may want to, there's no such thing as avoidance of risk. By avoiding one type of risk, you may subject yourself to more of another type of risk. If you get rid of nuclear power because it feels risky, then you might be burning more coal, and that might be worse for your health and for the climate. Unfortunately, these issues aren't, uh, don't filter through to policy in the same way. So we've now seen bans on GMOs imposed now by numerous countries across Europe, um, tragically and shamefully led by Scotland, um, thanks to the... Uh, malign influence of the nationalists. Um, and the scientific community feels, um, if you go by the statement which was signed by all of these different institutes, um, under, under assault. Because if you ban the application of a technology, then what's the point of researching it? So even though the SNP say, well, we're not banning what you're doing in the labs in the universities of Edinburgh and Dundee and everywhere, um, this, you'll never be allowed to use it. You have to, the doors of the lab will remain locked. Then why would you bother being, why would you even go into a career as a geneticist or a molecular biologist under those circumstances? So what we're doing at Cornell now, which I'm working for, is to try to broaden the debate on, on um, uh, not just GMOs, but on biotechnology and on agriculture more generally. Think back to uh, Tom's um, calculator, how the, and, and by the way, when I asked, I, I was the one who asked the question about um, why haven't you done land use, and that was not a plant. I'd actually forgotten how important land use is, um, but it's, it's transformative, as you saw. So if you can use these kinds of technologies to make agriculture more efficient um, and also more climate resilient, then of course it has to have a huge impact on, on future sustainability. And yet I think to some extent, sadly, the things are shifting in the opposite direction. Um, there's a real feeling of polarization I get um, from the sort of the contrasting, you get this on the left, the US presidential election is a good, good example, of course, you've got Bernie Sanders on the left, you've got Donald Trump on the right, and sort of the, 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 mid, the sensible middle is, is kind of disappearing in, in between. Uh, that, uh, those, those ones on the left there, that's Golden Dawn, which is the sort of the fascist party in, in Greece, which have not quite a swastika. It's almost a swastika, but not quite a swastika, so you can get away with it in Europe. Um, and apparently, 12 million Americans believe that lizard shape-shifting lizards run, run the country, if you, um, and that's due to the influence of David Icke, of course. Um, and uh, Donald Trump himself promoted the conspiracy theory about the birth, a conspiracy theory about Obama's birth um, being in Kenya or some other Muslim country, of course. And interestingly, the, I mean, the whole phenomenon of conspiracy theories is, I, I think, fascinating. If you, there is apparently some overlap between climate denialism, um, anti-vaccines, and uh, uh, feeling that the moon landing was uh, faked. And the, the thing, and this is my sort of parting shot, the problem with conspiracy theories is they aren't even internally coherent. So this is out of time, so thank you very much, and over to questions. <laughs> it's a nice desktop picture, isn't it? I've forgotten to have it on that. Can anyone see where that is? Come on, obvious. Vancouver Island. Yeah, yeah, Vancouver Island up there, Seattle, the Cascades, from the ISS, I think. So I can see obvious uh, uh, potential benefits of going to nuclear uh, with respect to emissions res compared to other fuels. How about the fact that uh, nuclear can be, has an obvious dual use in terms of weapon system, and that's developing this thing for all countries that would need energy. Are you talking about nuclear proliferation, the weapons issue? Yes. Yeah, it's always puzzled me why, it's like, you know, in the Bible you have the sort of beating swords into plowshares thing. 
we seem to have no problem with the swords, but everyone wants to eliminate the plowshares. So the peaceful use of nuclear energy has to be got rid of, and everyone stopped talking about nuclear weapons. It's, it's peculiar. And not only that, but one of the best uh, um, uh, sort of ways to, to tackle proliferation is to get rid of fissile material in weapons. And in the, in the US, they had what was called a, a megatons to megawatts program for the, for the last 15 years, where it decommissioned uh, highly enriched uranium from Soviet weapons was used to generate electricity in nuclear power stations. And actually, I think one in five American light bulbs for 15 years was lit up by an old Soviet weapon. So it is, uh, I, I think, it's also ways that you can make um, the uh, technology much more proliferation resistant if that's a concern about building nuclear power stations in, in, in other countries which aren't currently nuclear weapon states. But to be honest, most of the big emitters are nuclear weapon states already. And they're not looking to get more fissile material from nuclear power. You're talking about China, um, India, the US, you know, et cetera, and of course Russia. So um, I, I don't think that's nearly as much of a concern as people say, but it certainly, it certainly is an issue. You need to have a closed fuel cycle which is properly safeguarded, and we can do that internationally. I don't think that's a, a, an absolute be all end all issue for, for the use of nuclear power. Thank you. Um, hi, Mark. Uh, over here. Oh, yeah, hi. Yeah. Um, so I was always uh, really interested in pebble bed uh, nuclear reactors. I thought that would kind of help stem the debate on the scaremongering about nuclear power as well. Um, I mean, just the, just the basic idea that it's an inherently stable process. It's not an unstable process that requires active... Um, stabilization, which seems to be, you know, w and when that faults, then w that's when you get all these power stations blowing up. But with a pebble bed reactor, that that can't physically happen. So, do, do you know, do you know why that isn't talked about more? Maybe uh, it's not talked about because it's never been demonstrated. Um, there's a lot of paper reactors out there um, which have all wonderful designs. They'll be extremely cheap. They'll you know, like the one I showed, the sodium-cooled fast reactor, that's kind of a paper reactor too. They've, some of them have been uh, de demonstrated at much smaller scale, so you know, you're just R&D. Um, but it's, it's another thing to actually go to a, a commercial deployment. Um, and you need to turn these things out like sausages, really. If we're going to build tens of thousands to run the world, then you need to be able to build them at a much lower cost than is the, um, is the case at the moment. But just to come back to the, the public um, interaction thing, People, you know, you, you find pebble bed more reassuring perhaps because you are concerned about reactor engineering. Most people don't even know the difference between a bomb and a reactor, let alone the, understand that there's different types of reactor which may have different levels of risk or benefit associated with them. So that's, that's kind of the, the problem here. And, you know, I, I love the, calculate, the global calculator that, the, that Tom was showing earlier. And kind of the conclusion there was that getting people to change their lifestyles and Become, more, become vegetarian or use less energy or travel less was the most difficult thing. Therefore, we should go for the technological. But actually, the technological is equally difficult because of uh, so many inherent biases that we have against the deployment of some of the technologies which would otherwise be essential to do it. So I think that's really interesting to, to look at both sides of the ledger in that sort of uh, political, psychological way about what, what kinds of pathways actually might be able to get us to climate mitigation. Okay, uh, we are out of time, thank so you. let's thank Mark again. Yeah.